Systemic injustice is part and parcel as a result of living in a fallen world. The problem with an individualistic salvation only is you miss out on the systemic dimension of it. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. Welcome back to the show. Derwin L. Gray is my guest at the moment on Unapologetic. Derwin leads Transformation Church with his wife, Vicky. It's a multicultural, multi-generational, mission-shaped church in South Carolina. Uh, I know that you've got lots of people who follow you around the world on podcast and video as well, Derwin. But your book really uh, comes out of your experience as a pastor there, How to Heal Our Racial Divide. And if you want more on that, Derwin L. Gray dot com and we spent the last couple of episodes talking about your story the church's story the biblical witness to uh racial reconciliation uh, racial justice um but come bringing it to the kind of you know that this cultural moment we inhabit right now it, it, everything you said makes sense up to this point except that christians suddenly get really divided on how we are meant to put this into practice and that a lot of people i think are concerned that we're adopting a very secular minded approach to how to do racial reconciliation racial justice there's been a lot of terms being thrown about at the moment critical race theory the black lives matter movement white privilege systemic injustice and so on they've become a lightning rod for controversy really and 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 so i i just thought i'd, I'd maybe put some of these issues to you and and just see 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 what you make of them and, and how you would respond to them derwin um firstly you know, critical race theory, CRT, as it's sometimes called. A lot of people say that's where a lot of the anti-racism kind of ideology comes from at the moment, and that it's not ultimately a Christian way of looking at the world. It's about power dynamics. It's based on a kind of Marxist um, sort of theory of oppressor and oppressed and so on, uh, that ultimately it's not a grace-filled thing. It's it's kind of you are always tarred with being an irredeemable oppressor if you're a white person you're always going to be a victim if you're a black person uh Vody Borkum, you know uh as who i'm sure you're aware of uh is 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 very critical for instance as one voice um against crt so what what where do you kind of draw the line on these kinds of issues uh in, in this way derwin yeah so the first thing that i will say is this Let's have a proper understanding of CRT. For me, as a pastor and New Testament scholar, I don't need CRT. Okay, so let me do some explaining here. First of all, CRT comes out of a gentleman by the name of Derek Bell. He was a Army veteran. Uh, he, he was a part of Dr. King's uh, movement, civil rights. He went to Harvard, law professor. And critical race theory simply says this, laws have been designed in America that produce racist outcomes. So for example, um, slavery, that's obvious. Um, segregation, Jim Crow, that's obvious. When you look at a historical understanding of redlining for homes and those types of things. Critical race theory is an advanced legal study that lawyers use in their training. That's number one. Most people that I have encountered do not know who Derek Bell is or what critical race theory is. There are some caricatures of critical race the theory. This is what I would say as Christians, we should not bear false witness. For example, if I'm critiquing a Muslim or Islamic worldview, I should understand that worldview and not make a caricature. What I'm saying for followers of Jesus, and once again, I don't need CRT to do history, but we should at least critique CRT correctly. Um, if there are children in elementary school, middle school, and high school that can advance, that can understand advanced legal theory, those are some smart kids because lawyers in training struggle to understand CRT. Secondly, I think that CRT has been deduced to this boogeyman and what a lot of people are believing is actually not CRT, but a caricature and a boogeyman to 
move away from any legitimate conversation about racial reconciliation. Um, CRT does not say one group of people are evil simply because they're a group of pe people. That's not what CRT is. So what I would say is read a CRT scholar actually. It's amazing. When I challenge people online, I said, well, tell me about the CRT scholars you've actually read. They haven't. They've listened to pe people who aren't CRT scholars who strip CRT of what CRT actually is. I'm not a CRT apologist. As a Christian, I want us to bear true witness to that which we are critiquing because unbelievers are going, you guys lie. You're building straw men to tear them down. So in my understanding of CRT, um, I'm like, whatever, I'm not a lawyer. That, that still does not diminish the reality of racism in our country. Just historically, indigenous people and genocide, Native Americans, people being enslaved. Uh, when we look at the laws and uh, we know that historically that racism has played a part in the United States of America. Listen, I love my country. I wouldn't want to be a citizen anywhere else except for maybe Norway. Norway is pretty awesome. <laughs> I'm joking. But it is, it is awesome, though. I, I love being an American, and America has come a long way. But to critique what has been wrong doesn't mean you're not American. It means you're a sensible person. So um, CRT for me has become more of a boogeyman that is riling up people and scaring people to where you can't even have legitimate conversation. And, and Justin, let me add, add, add this. I have had pastor friends who are white mention George Floyd and people have left their churches in droves saying you're being woke, you're being CRT. Yeah, I, well, I, and that's the problem, isn't it? That, that so often caricatures are what often end up getting debated and passed around rather than the, you know, the actual thing. And as you say, oftentimes it, it is used as a way of kind of deflecting from what are actual issues that need to be addressed. I mean, just to stick with it for a moment, though, I mean, one, one of the critiques I've, I've heard, uh, we had it on a recent edition of My Unbelievable Show, where one of the guests said the problem that he sees with the current kind of language around anti-racism and CRT and so on is that it actually reinforces a kind of division between different people. It says, if you are white, then this is who you are and this is the culture you're part of and this is the kind of problem that you represent. If you are black, this is the kind of culture you're from, this is the culture. And he, he just objected to, to having those kinds of labels applied and said that it's a, he, he saw it as a retrograde thing to kind of um, be, be speaking in that sense of, of these divisions. And do you recognize that at all, that there's a danger of, of kind of actually inflaming division uh, in when we are stoking these kinds of conversations or debates? Uh, you know what? I, that's really not a non issue for me because I'm a Bible guy. And so that's why my book subtitle is what the Bible says. So this is what I do know. Every human being that's born is totally depraved. What I do know is this, is that if believers don't walk in the spirit, they walk in the flesh. What I do know is this, is there are dark demonic powers. So as long as those three realities are alive, all types of sin, including racism, white supremacy, prejudice, bigotry are alive and well. And so what I do not subscribe to is the notion of, well, if we don't talk about it, it'll just go away. Well, we don't do that with abortion. We don't do that with greed. We don't do that with marital problems. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we should speak from a biblical perspective. I typically, when people go, what do you think about CRT? I go, I don't. And I take, take them to the Bible because I don't want any distraction to those things. But no, we should not broad brush people. But what we can say is all people are born totally depraved. If you're a Christian, we can say, if you're not walking the spirit, walking the flesh, what we can say is there's dark demonic powers that are waging war against us constantly. And what we can say is, yes, there is ethnic strife and division. We look at the United States of America. Of America. We just had another 
white supremacist shooting of black people. Another one. This country's littered with that. We also had a Chinese man go into a Taiwanese church and commit murder as well. And if we go all around the world, there is ethnic tension everywhere. Yeah. I mean, and I think when you when you look at the figures, you look at, you know, the statistics, it's it's hard to avoid the fact that institutional prejudice racism does exist uh, in certain out the outcomes that you see in parts of America especially and and I'm sure here in the UK there are, there are similar examples that could be given and yet a lot of people sort of say well look it, it's not perfect but hey we're a lot further on from where we were um and yet a lot of people of color they would say are are, are acting as though things are worse than ever before when uh, and and to, to that extent I think some people feel like race is kind of being put across as almost the defining issue of this generation or as as the kind of this is always the answer to any social injustice that exists whereas i think you know when i spoke with vody bokum a while ago about this he 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 was his concern was that the problem with this ideology is potentially that you will reinforce for you know a young man of color that he's always a victim um and that may not actually be helpful ultimately um what what where's the balance we need to strike on this well i would reject the premise of mr uh Bauckham. um i would totally 100 reject that and i would start as a pastor and theologian if you're in christ you're not a victim you are more than an overcomer in him who loved us that's number one number two that does not mean that they're is not still issues that you have to deal with as a black man in the United States of America. So I reject his premise of that. And once again, I just want to go back to the scriptures. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Bible guy, right? So the reality is we need to walk in the spirit and be aware that there are dark demonic forces and because this is not yet the new heavens, new earth, systemic injustice is part and parcel as a result of living in a fallen world. The problem with an individualistic salvation only is you miss out on the systemic dimension of it. For example, in South Africa with apartheid, that is systemic. If you go to Israel, there are some systemic issues. I mean, my goodness, with Russia and Ukraine, that is ethnic. Uh, uh, Vladimir Putin propaganda is saying there are Nazis there. We're going to go get them. Uh, when you go to Myanmar, when you go all around the world. So I'm getting a little passionate here because a lot of times if the boot is not on your neck, if the noose is not on your neck, it's slow down. Let's wait. Let's do this. When the U.S. capital of democracy was overrun by people. They didn't wait. They saw that there were some things that they believed that were unjust. And so they were beating police officers with, a, with the American flag that they so highly esteemed. So um, what I would say is, is this. If we're going to be Bible people, let's be Bible people and say, if you're in Christ, no, you're not a victim. You are more than a conquering him who loved us. But yet that does not mean for Jesus of Nazareth, as he was growing up going, all I see here in Israel is Jewish men on a cross because it is unlawful for Roman men to be on crosses. That's systemic injustice. When Jesus went to the temple and he overturned the money ta tables, what, what, what took place? The Sanhedrin bought money booths from the Romans and put up a systemic system that was unjust, keeping Gentiles away from God. That's systemic injustice. In Acts chapter 6, when the widows who were Hebraic were getting the lion's share of the daily distribution of food, that was systemic injustice. So for some reason, I'm not quite sure why? Um, if I can share a personal story, uh, I was a, I was a I was a team chaplain for my son's football team. We we're playing a school called Charlotte Catholic. They were incredible. They're a machine. Our our team was not. 
And so I told them the story about David and Goliath, and I had a slingshot. So in the pregame, I'm telling the guys, remember, we're going to sling our stones. So we're going back into the locker room. I go into a public bathroom. I put the slingshot in my back pocket because I had to use the restroom. I come back out. Two white police officers are there. And they say, why do you have a weapon? And I'm laughing because everybody knows Derwin Gray. I've been on TV. I've been on radio. We have a prominent mm-hmm. ministry. Hey, everybody likes me. I'm Derwin. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I said, oh, you mean the slingshot? I said, hey, I'm the team chaplain. I'm telling the team about David and Goliath. And this is to remind them. And man, they begin to t- talk to me so disrespectfully, so dishonorably. And it reminded me of a kid when I had no power of how police would do whatever they wanted to do to us. When they would just search us for no reason. And I'm finding myself as a grown man. I'm like, I pay your taxes. I got children and you're going to disrespect me. Also, I'm smart enough to know that if I got out of line, that would have just been an excuse for them. So I had to eat that. And as I'm eating that, Another white police officer that was a part of our church comes over and goes, Pastor Derwin. And he gave me a big hug and a kiss. And immediately he sensed the tension and he goes, is there a problem here? And they looked at him and said, oh, is this your pastor? He goes, yeah. And they go, okay, you can go keep your slingshot. So as I'm walking away, I'm, I'm pissed, Justin, because there's so many men that are black who are not Derwin Gray, who played for the Panthers, who's a prominent pastor who have friends that are police officers. I'm like, man, I've actually worked with the Charlotte Mecklenburg police on racism and racial relationships. And here I am being disrespected. All they had to say was, excuse me, sir. We heard that you have a weapon. Can you see, you know, I would have understood that because we live in violent times, but don't talk to me like I'm less than a man. Don't talk to me like I'm less than a human being. This happens over and over and over. And it, Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and, and frequently, you know, and, and that is the issue that often people who are not people of color who are white don't have the the the, the perspective of all of the experiences that uh, someone like yourself has, you know, someone from a different ethnic origin has and, and therefore make assumptions about the way police treat them or make assumptions about the way society treats them. Uh, and it's easy to see why that would boil over into frustration and even, you know, sometimes, you know, violent protest when a certain people group say enough is enough and and so on. How do you how do you counsel how how we actually do this reconciliation thing, though? Because I, I guess there are there are good and bad ways and you can understand why, you know, people go down a kind of more activist, even aggressive route in in kind of demonstrating I mean, you've been part of those peaceful demonstrations around, you know, the time of George Floyd's murder and so on. But but where's what's a Christian response to actually seeing seeing change happen? OK, yeah. So let me so let me pause here. Um, have you ever heard of the Tulsa race riots? Mm-hmm. So that's the response of a white mob to Black Wall Street in the 60s, Alabama. Birmingham was called Bombingham because black churches were blown up by white supremacists. If you look at the great displays of domestic violence and protests, it hasn't been people of color, ask the Native Americans. Um, So let's make sure we get that on record because that's very important. Peaceful protest is a wonderful thing. And let us not forget that out of a church in Alabama, a young preacher by the name of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King led one of the greatest cultural revolutions in history. The civil rights was peaceful protest. Uh, These young people had to read the Sermon on the Mount daily to prepare to respond in nonviolence. And it changed the world. So let's not forget that was a Christian movement. So black people have shown a history of peace against violence. Now, there are some 
elements recently that have been violent. Obviously, we don't condone that. But historically, I think that's a fraction of the violence mm. that has been perpetrated against us. And in the words of C.S. Lewis, let's not be chronological snobs, meaning our time is just our time. There's a historical garment that we live in that is a thread. So that's that's really, really important. I've been a part of peaceful protests. We, we should peacefully protest. Violence is never the answer. Unfortunately, that's not been the case for people of color, specifically um, African-Americans. The violence has been perpetrated against us in massive ways. But let me get back to my central theme here. If the local church is a community of the redeemed and you have people from different ethnicities and social economic cl classes doing life together, proximity breeds intimacy into me, you see. You begin to advocate for people that are not just rumors, but people who are actually those you love. One of the fascinating things that mm -hmm. I've seen at our church is when white parents adopt black kids, specifically black little boys. When the little boys are little, they're cute and cuddly. But when they become teenagers, they become a threat. And the white parents will say, Pastor, we just <clears throat> never knew our white son is treated differently than our black son. And we just never knew. And of course, I give them counsel. But then I, I say, how could you have not known your black brothers and sisters have been telling you for so long? The reason why you knew is because the pain became proximate. Mm, mm, mm. Do not let the pain become proximate before you begin to care. As Christians, we should care. And that follows the model of Jesus. Justin, can you imagine in the eternal counsel of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, <clears throat> knowing omnisciently what was going to take place on earth with sin? And Jesus goes, hey, Father and Spirit, I ain't going. That is not my problem. I'm holy. No, love says I'm going into the problem because love is the solution. And so we need to care, as Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. That's basic Christianity. Yeah, yeah. You, you get the feeling Jesus wouldn't have just been sharing his views on Twitter. He would have been meeting people in person and talking to them and uh, and actually understanding and building the real a life situations. church that embodies it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're going to talk about the church in the next edition of the show, um, because I want to talk about Transformation Church itself and what you've seen there and, and how, you know, on a very practical level, Christians can embody this this movement, this uh, not just a kind of politicized sort of version of reconciliation, but something that is truly Christ centered um, uh, and, and looks like Jesus when it comes to the church. So that's what we'll be talking about next time on the show. But thank you very much for joining me on this edition of Unapologetic. Delway. Thank you. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. For more shows, resources and our newsletter, visit premierunbelievable.com. 